Welcome to Idea Gen TV live from Washington, D.C. Today, I am honored, privileged to have with me Sia Raj Parohit, education go to market from OpenAI. Welcome, Sia. Thanks so much for having me. Really excited to share what OpenAI is doing in education. Well, you know, we're all hearing about OpenAI, um, we're hearing about AI in general. There's a lot of misconceptions, perhaps. You're in education, which is really an exciting arena for AI, obviously. And so I'd like to ask you for our global audience, um, give us a little bit about your background so they, so they know who you are and specifically what your role is at OpenAI. Absolutely. So I've been working in education since I was 18. When I was in college, I was studying computer engineering. And now this is common knowledge, but a lot of universities don't teach STEM degrees in a way that's accessible to everyone. And I started seeing that as a student. A lot of my classmates started dropping out of their engineering programs. People who would have become really good engineers, but they weren't able to learn in the way that was being that engineering was being taught. So I did this research project where I cold emailed some really famous people to ask for their opinion on why someone should study engineering. This is 2010, 2011, so before the whole learn to code movement had taken off, before people knew how powerful STEM careers could be. And I turned my research into a book about America's job skills gap that I published in 19. So since then, I'm trying to solve that problem, trying to make these skills much more accessible for people so they can move into new socioeconomic classes. In my career, I've been early at two high growth ed tech companies, worked in venture capital, investing in companies like Coursera and Course Hero. And then for the past three years, I was at Amazon doing education partnerships. I joined OpenAI about eight months ago to help build up our education vertical. And my job is to think about the future of AI at universities and school districts. So we're spending a lot of time imagining like the future of these campuses and how AI plays in to help people learn skills better, to help them grow in their professional journeys. And so that's the work I do at OpenAI now. You know, uh, how, how much more exciting could that be? I, I'd love to follow up on that, which is incredibly exciting, to ask how this technology at OpenAI intersects with the needs, the broader needs of the education sector. And then what are the biggest opportunities you see for AI in transforming education across the spectrum? So ever since I started working in education, as a sector, our goal was to achieve personalized learning. We always said that if we can provide a personalized tutor for every student, we have made it as a sector, because then it can adapt to the students' needs, help them grow in their careers, and whatever skills they want to develop. And I think that with ChatGPT, we have achieved it. Like, I have a personalized tutor that I talk to. It knows my projects, it knows my aspirations, it knows my manager's personality and how I should correspond with them. Like, it just helps me become a much better knowledge worker. And I'm really excited. Like, our vision is to be able to provide this in the hands of all students and learners and teachers and educators around the world. And we're at the very beginning of that journey, but excited to kind of share what we've done so far there. It's just awesome to be involved in anything that's transformative. I've heard this being akin to the industrial revolution or those moments in history where there's been so much transformation happening. And by the time you figure it out, it's already happened. So we're living through this transformation. I mean, every single one of us are using ChatGPT or whatever AI platform you prefer. In my case, it's ChatGPT, of course. And <laughs> I love it. I mean, it learns, it's helpful, it, it helps you get a start if you're writing something. And, and I can't even imagine, you know, that even schools now in education are trying to figure it out. Do we ban it? Do we embrace it? Do we, you know, do we sign an ethics code? I'm not using an AI platform for education, but the smart schools will embrace it, I think. And we'll say, utilize it as a tool because it's all about the prompts, right? It's about yeah. being able, able to utilize like a dictionary or a thesaurus or whatever it may be to help you get better, to accelerate. Is that right? So it's so interesting. ChatGPT came out two years ago. And for the first year, a lot of schools, like you said, banned it because they were trying to figure out how like, to rethink curriculum and assignments and learning in the age of AI. But something changed about 10 or 11 months ago. My belief is that influencers like Ethan Mollick, who's a professor at Wharton, really helped destigmatize AI in education and started showing what the value could be in classes. And now we're getting closer to the main part of that adoption curve. A lot more professors at universities, a lot more teachers in school districts starting to think about how to incorporate AI. 
And that's where it gets super exciting because that means we're rethinking the assignments that we give our students, knowing that now they have access to the super intelligence that's outside of their brains. So now we need to almost make them like as great like orchestrators and be able to use AI to produce really good output. And that shift is just so exciting, I think. I think it's incredible to hear about super intelligence. I mean, we all think we're somewhat intelligent, but when you think about super intelligence, it takes it to the next level, right? And so ethics, innovation, how do you balance these considerations when taking also into account the issue of privacy? Absolutely. So a couple of things to unpack here. The first is around like accessibility of this technology. One of OpenAI's core goals is to make the safe artificial general intelligence accessible to everyone around the world. So one of the first things was to launch a free product. Um, many of you might have tried out the free product, ChatGPT. It's actually really good. Like it provides a lot of the capabilities for free to any user around the world who has internet. And then just to double down on that, just about a month ago, we launched a 1-800 number for ChatGPT. So older adults in the US who are used to the 1-800 numbers and being able to call and talk are able to do that, which is like a really nice unlock for a new demographic. We also launched ChatGPT on WhatsApp. So now people in like um, in developing countries who may not have that much internet bandwidth but can still get on WhatsApp can chat with ChatGPT. So we're trying to solve for accessibility in these ways. I'm excited because I think that's going to unlock the next billion users in developing countries uh, with these kind of platforms. And on the privacy side, um, we launched a product called ChatGPT EDU. This is designed for like it's an enterprise grade security platform designed for school districts and universities. So now professors can upload their content, like the entire year's case materials onto ChatGPT. And we don't train like our models based on that information. It's secure. It lives only in their workspace. Only they and their admins have control of it. So it gives a lot more security and privacy to that content which I'm excited about because professors become much more comfortable with it. And so taking that even a step further in terms of collaboration with educators and institutions, how do you ensure, you've talked a little bit about this, but how do you ensure that OpenAI's models meet their needs specifically? So initially we were actually, it's an interesting product because for most products, you do like different types of user research, you develop the use cases, then you market those. In our case, we actually learned the use cases from the professors themselves. So over the past year, we've seen a lot of interesting things happen. Some of the most likely ways that professors are using this and how we're now explaining to the next generation of professors how to think about it are one is around like information retrieval. So what professors call lecture recall. So one of the most common use cases is professors can upload their semesters worth of content and students can ask questions to that content. So a business school professor at Harvard Business School uploaded all of his case studies and now students ask questions like, which CEO handle layoffs well? And get the exact examples to help them understand that concept. Or like, I'm learning this esoteric statistics concept. Where will I ever use this in life? And you can get practical examples. So it's your ability to converse with the knowledge of the university in a much deeper way than ever before. And that makes it super interesting for students. Most of the curi and most of the questions from students come between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m., which right. is also in a human TA is not available. So it's like been a great support system for students. Right. It's like a TA as well. It's yeah. like a TA. Yeah, yes. yeah absolutely. <laughs> so, Sia, so yeah, what inspired your initial interest in education and technology? You're, you're marrying the two, which is so exciting. Like, what inspired you to get involved in this? So as I mentioned at 18, it was a personal problem. I was like, is this a SIA problem? Is this a system problem? Thankfully realized or felt it was a system problem that was preventing me from becoming a good engineer. And now I think the aspiration is how can we use technology to help anyone kind of get to those aspirations and not feel that the system is rigged against them because they don't learn in the way that classes used to teach content. Right, right, exactly. And so you also worked in venture capital and ed tech, and this all influenced your current approach at OpenAI. Tell us about that. So I worked as an investor at a fund called GSV Ventures, this is a billion dollar ed tech uh, VC fund. And then I founded my own VC fund a couple years ago with my friend um, Taylor Stockton. Um, it's called Pathway Ventures. So with Pathway, we invest in early stage founders. It's pre-seed and seed, future of learning and work. And that's been really exciting because we're able to think a lot about economic mobility from different angles. 
Like initially we thought it was like an education game. I'm like, okay, if you can teach online in different ways, it's going to solve the problems. But then you realize that you're fighting on so many different dimensions. Individuals who are hourly workers don't have the time to learn a lot of times. And then they, after like a busy day of work, they use Netflix instead of like coming and learning on Coursera or Udacity. So these kind of elements we need to fight to be able to give people the opportunity to learn more effectively are the types of things we're trying to invest in now. And so examples we've talked a lot about your background and your interests and your journey what's an example of a successful project or partnership that you've spearheaded specifically at OpenAI? so at OpenAI, we're working with a lot of universities ranging from like the ivy league state schools community colleges school districts i think some of the most interesting conversations we're having right now are with professors who are really rethinking their curriculum there's a Wharton MBA professor named Stefano Pontoni who was talking to me about, he's like, what is the value of an essay? And just for context, for the 10 years he was teaching this class, an essay was always the final submission from his MBA students. So he's like, what is the value of an essay? The value of an essay is not necessarily in its output, but in the conversational skills and the critical thinking skills that get to that output. So now he requires the students use ChatGPT. He's like, they're going to use it anyway, might as well require it. And instead, he measures the number of prompts it takes a student to get to an essay that they're happy with. Some students are so good at prompt engineering that it takes like two or three prompts and they have a really good essay. And some students go back 19 or 20 times to get to an essay that they're happy with. So this is super interesting because this is a measure of your ability to clearly articulate what you're looking for as an output. And that's going to become a really key skill. Because again, the super intelligence exists. How can you orchestrate it and visualize really good output that you can get to with it? And so really excited about that shift. And I guess one other thing I'd add here is that when I think forward to the skills that I would want the next generation and like our children to learn, it's two things. One is this ability to visualize that great output. So you have to read le really good books. You have to be able to see really good content and understand what that extraordinary output can look like. And then the second is like the ability to inspire. So how can you use these tools to do some of the back end work and you become the charismatic and inspiring figure who can like rally a team or close a partnership and do all the human things that AI can't. That's really cool to for the global audience to hear that there's still a role for human beings uh, within the context of AI. And so it's all about the prompt is what I'm hearing. Is, are you able to ask the right questions? The right questions, yes. And AI systems will get smarter at deducing what you're asking. Yeah. So I don't think prompt engineering is a skill, but I do think that the ability to visualize the output is. To visualize the output. That is, it's just, it's mind blowing. Um, leadership, this is the Global Leadership Summit. How has your leadership, and let's add the overlay of OpenAI on top of this, evolved to where you are today? So interesting. Um, I think that when I first became a manager or a leader in different companies, I used to think that a really good manager was the second best person on any team to do any job. And they were able to kind of step in, fill in when uh, like a coworker kind of completed a project or has to go sick or something. They, I thought that they were supposed to be the back end replacement. And now I think 10 years in, I think that a really good manager or leader is able to see things in an individual that they can't see in themselves. And that's also what makes like a human manager much better than like an AI manager in some ways, because an AI knows what you tell it about yourself. But a, a human manager, especially a really good one, can see things you don't articulate about yourself and help you double down on the things that make you extraordinary and help you hopefully become a much better like version of yourself or a much higher thinking individual on who you can become. See, you know, this has been such a profound interview. We could go on for days, days and days. I have many prompts that I could ask you that just like I do with OpenAI. But I'd like to say, what is your call to action for our global audience here today? From OpenAI. Yeah. One thing I just want to call out is a lot of people reach out to me being afraid that they're behind the AI curve in some ways. They're like, there's so much happening. How do I stay up to date? And I just want to kind of reassure them. Not all of us have to become experts on the sector as a whole. And don't feel the need to do that almost. Like you don't need to understand all the nuances of the technology. You need to understand how you can use the product to become a better knowledge worker, better at your profession, whatever that may be. 
And that's a much easier ask to take on because in the future, I think your ability to use AI in your job will help you become more productive. And hopefully, like I hear from a lot of people that they're much more fulfilled in their careers because they can use AI. So that's our, like, that's the goal I think we should be striving for. Not to all of us become like um, Ethan Mollick level of experts in AI. That's right. That's right. See uh, Raj Prohit, go to market at, for education at OpenAI, inspiring the world. Thank you so very much. Thanks so much. Thank you.